and come to Easy Alim Learning Simplified. My name is Ruth and today we are going to be learning on rates of reaction and reversible reactions. So today we're just going to do the introduction bit on rate <clears throat> and then we are going to do one question. So the rate of a chemical reaction is the time taken for a given mass uh, of products to be formed or a given time of a mass of the reactant to be consumed. So we know in a reaction we have the reactants and the products. So the reactants are being used up in the reaction and, and the products are being formed in a reaction. So the amount of the time it takes for the reactant to be complete or used up or the time it takes for the product to be formed, that is what we refer to as the chemical rate of a chemical reaction. So that some reactions are actually too slow to be determined, such as rusting. Others are very fast and instantaneous, like, for example, neutralization of an acid with bases. And then others are very explosive, um, like when you react potassium with water or sodium with dilute acids. So it is important for us to see, like, different reactions have different rates at which they react. So before we start even on the rate of reaction, like in details, there's something referred to as the collision theory. So collision theory, this is the theory we are going to be using even when we are describing these reactions. So the collision theory is an application of the kinetic theory of matter, which assumes that matter is made up of tiny particles, uh, for example, atoms and molecules. So kinetic theory says that these particles are in a random constant motion. So the theory itself proposes that the reaction for a reaction to occur, particles must collide. And not all collisions are, are good or like they are successful or that will bring a reaction. Only specific uh, collisions that bring a chemical reaction, we say that those ones are the ones that are successful collisions. We need successful collisions so that a chemical reaction can occur. Then also we have to consider the speed at which these particles collide with each other. And this speed is what we refer to as the frequency. So the higher the collision frequency, the tendency to have more successful collisions that will help formation of product. So the higher chances of successful collision, the faster the reaction. So you can see the, 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 the relationship between collision, the rate of collision, successful collisions, and the rate of reaction. So the average distance between solid particles from one another, it's too big for them to meet and collide successfully. So if you look at solid, the particles are in fixed state. So even collision is a bit hard. So what we do, these solids actually dissolve in a, in a solvent. Solvent acts as a medium. It helps to dissociate the particles, giving them enough space to move around. If they're able to move around, it means they're able to collide. So successful collision can take place if the particles colliding have the required energy and the right orientation, which increases their vibration and intensity for successful collision to form product. So you see, it's not just only successful colliding. For them to successfully collide, they, they, they need to have the amount of energy, enough energy. They also need to be oriented so that they can hit each other in the right orientation so that that reaction can occur. So the rate of reaction is not just the rate of reaction. You can see it's all about the interaction of the particles in that certain state, in the certain space. So we measure the rate of reaction in terms of the, how much the product is consumed or how much the reactant disappears, how much product appears. So you notice like, for example, if you were to plot the curve of concentration against time, so you'd have two curves, you can place them in the same um, graph or in different graphs, mm -hmm. but you can see there's a curve that forms in the first graph, and then this is what forms in the second graph. So for example, if you were to determine, for example, the reaction between hydrochloric acid and marble chips, so there are two ways to do it. We can determine the amount of the reactants, how much time they are consumed, or now the product that is going to be formed. In this case, it's carbon four oxide that is being formed. So first of all, if you were to calculate the mass that is decreasing with time, as you have said, we can measure the masses of the reactant, which is hydrochloric acid and marble chips. 
and as the reaction occurs we are measuring the mass with a time or with different times so at the end of the day you notice this is the graph that we are going to form this graph shows like as the start of the experiment you see the time is zero and also the mass is at like full it's very high no no loss has happened but as you can see as the reaction continues we are losing a certain amount of mass of the reactant as the time continues and then we get to a point where we the, the the reaction is complete so the mass is not being lost anymore so that's why the the, the graph um stag becomes stagnant as the time progresses so this was measuring the amount of time the reactants are used up so we can also measure the amount of product being formed. So in this case, we are going to form carbon four oxide. So we have to collect that gas and you can see we are using a syringe to collect that gas. So instead of allowing the gas to go to the atmosphere, it is collected. So this is the graph that is going to be used. You can see the volume of the gas formed against time. The same thing will happen. The volume is very low at the start because the reaction is still uh, they're still like static but the reaction is very fast so that's why it goes up very quickly the volume increases very steadily in the first few minutes and then it starts stagnating as you continue with time this means that the reactants are all being used up so when we get to this point where it starts stagnating it means that the reaction is complete no more gas is being formed so you've seen the two ways. So we have considered the mass of the reactant being used up, and now we have considered the product being formed. So in the whole topic of rate of reaction, it's all about the reactant and the product. So we'll be moving them um, uh, from one to the other, and then now we compare it with the different properties. So we also have another concept called the activation energy. So activation energy is the minimum amount of energy which reactants must overcome before they react. So they need to overcome this energy. It helps them, to, it helps to, to, to start the reaction. So activation energy is usually needed for board breaking for the reacting particles. We need it for board breaking. So board breaking is an endothermic process, as we said earlier in energy changes, because it, we need to, that energy to be absorbed to enable it to be used to breaking those boards. The higher the board energy, the slower the reaction, because now that reaction needs to overcome this um, activation energy, which is very large, which causes the reaction to start slower. So activation energy does not influence, influence whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic. It just helps into starting the reaction. So you can see this in this graph, we have the initial state of the reactant. So they have to overcome this energy up here so that the reaction can occur. But at the end of the day, this reaction is, you can see it is exothermic in endothermic in nature because you can see the final product are at a higher uh, a higher energy uh, rate in comparison to the reactant. So the activation energy does not really affect um, if a reaction is exothermic or endothermic, but all the reactions need to overcome the activation energy. So the activation energy can be a lot or small. It will affect how fast a reaction occurs. So there are some factors that determine the value of the activation energy. So the strength of the board in the particles of the reactant. So if the strength if the board is very strong it means it will have a higher activation energy if the board is not that strong it means it will have a lower activation energy so whether the reaction is exothermic or um or endothermic and the presence of catalysts we will come to catalysts and their effects on the rate of reaction we will talk about how it helps them to overcome the rate of the activation energy faster so let's do one question in regards to what we have just discussed so study the energy level below and answer the questions that follow. So we have a graph of energy against uh, reaction path, and you can see the energy given off as we proceed. We have the reactants and the products. So the reactants are here, the products are here. So first of all, this tells you that it is an exothermic reaction. <laughs> This is because you can see the uh, reactants are at a higher energy, as you can see from the graph, uh, in comparison to the product. And if you were to calculate the amount of energy 
if it is an exothermic given off, you just take this value in between here. But now we can see there is another uh, value that goes up. So the first question is states and explain whether the reaction presented is endothermic and exothermic. I've already said it's exothermic because the energy of the products is lower than the reactants. And then determine the activation energy. So this is the activation energy. This is the energy that this reaction has to overcome for the reaction to begin. So this is the activation energy. Uh, and you will notice it will always be shown in reaction, especially with uh, energy level diagrams. So that brings us to the end. This was just the introduction bit of rate of reactions. So we have known what rate is and we have introduced the collision theory and the activation energy. So we are going to be focusing on these ones as we continue with the uh, factors that affect rates of reaction. You notice you are going to be mentioning some of these things that we've mentioned. So that's it for today. See you in the next lesson as we look at these factors that affect the rates of reaction.